Hello, hello everybody and welcome to week four of Social Surveys and Questionnaire Design BX3181 for JCU. My name is Natasha Butler and I will be taking this lecture for you today. And this week we're speaking about survey research for marketing. This lecture has been taken from chapter five of our textbook, which is Marketing Research Asia Pacific edition. Um, I think it's the fourth edition off the top of my head. Oops, sorry, I should, it'll be in the notes anyway. So the to this topic for us begins with an overview of the types of errors that can arise um, when we're conducting research or in our survey research. And then it identifies the three main types of survey research design and the role of, you know, on, now that we've gone online, of course, that's really quite emphasized. And then we discuss why a trial run may identify any errors prior to survey distribution and why that element is so important. But ultimately, there is no best form of survey design. It really comes up to you and what you're wanting to get out of your survey. Each has its advantages and disadvantages. And by the time we get to the end of this lecture, you should have a bit of a good idea about what's going to work for you or not work for you when it comes to creating your survey. Well, moving right along, possibly, maybe. So the learning outcomes for this week is to be able to define surveys and describe the type of information that should be gathered in a survey. To be able to explain the advantages and disadvantages of surveys to identify the sources of errors in survey research, to, dis to distinguish among the various categories of surveys, summarize the different ways researchers implement surveys, know the advantages and disadvantages of distributing a questionnaire via different means, a appreciate the importance of pre-testing questionnaires, and then of course, looking at the ethical elements that arise when we're doing survey research. So let's get to our first bit, shall we? Oh, so I went backwards. So let's first look at this, at the nature of surveys. Surveys require asking people, or as they're also known as respondents, for information using either written or verbal questioning. Questionnaires or interviews collect data face-to-face -face via mail, telephone, or questioning. Questionnaires or interviews collect um, the more formal term sample survey emphasizes that the purpose of conducting respondents is to obtain a representative sample of the target population. Thus, a survey is defined a method of primary data collection based on communication with a representative of a representative sample of individuals. The type of individual uh, the type of information <laughs> gathered depends on the survey's objectives. Most survey research is descriptive research, which attempts to identify and explain a particular marketing activity, such as identifying characteristics of target markets, to measure consumer attitudes, or else describe consumer purchasing patterns. Marketing surveys typically have multiple objectives. Few gather only a single type of information. Although surveys are often conducted to quantify um, certain information, particular aspects of surveys may also be qualitative. For example, in a new product development, the qualitative objective of a survey is often to test and refine new product concepts. Surveys are quite flexible and when they're conducted properly, they're an extremely, extremely valuable to managers because they provide a quick, inexpensive, efficient and accurate means of assessing information about the population. However, if researchers don't conduct surveys well, or if the survey itself contains certain errors, then it renders them useless. Oops. And look, honestly, it's not uncommon for errors to occur when we're conducting survey research. This, uh, the table that you see here is exhibit 5.1 and that has been taken from your text. And this outlines the various forms of survey error that can affect the accuracy of a survey. Survey error can be broken down into two types, random sampling errors and uh, sy systematic errors. So let's have a look at both of those in more detail now, shall we? Random sampling error is, is because most surveys try to portray a representative cross-section of a particular target population. But even with technically 
uh, even with technic technically proper probability sampling, random sampling errors will occur because of chance variation. Without increasing the sample size, these statistical problems are unavoidable. However, random sampling errors can be estimated, and we go into this in a bit more detail in Chapter 12. Systematic errors result from some imperfect research design or from a mistake in the execution of the research. These errors are also called non-sampling errors. A sample bias exists when the, research, when the results of a sample show a persistent tendency to deviate in one direction for, uh, from the true value of the population parameter. The two general categories of systematic error are respondent error and administrative error. Both of these types of errors can be managed, for example, through the execution of the research. And let's have a little bit look further into these two categories of systematic errors. The first being respondent errors, because if respondents don't cooperate or if they don't give us truthful answers, then we might have two types of errors that might occur. And this is either a non-response error or a response bias. So let's have a look at that non-response error to start with. To use the results of a survey, the researcher must be sure that those who did respond to the questionnaire were representative of those who did not. If only those who responded are included in the survey, then a non-response error will occur. Non-respondents are most common in mail surveys, but they might also occur in telephone and personal surveys in the form of no contact, such as people not being at home or people refusing to participate. The number of no contacts has been increasing because of the proliferation of answering machines and the growing usage of caller ID to screen telephone calls. Answering machines. Message bank, sorry. <laughs> Self-selection may also occur in self-administered questionnaires. In this situation, only those people who feel strongly about the subject matter will actually respond. And this can cause an over-representation of extreme positions. Comparing the demographics of the sample with the demographics of the target population is one means of expecting for possible biases. Additional efforts should be made uh, to obtain data from underrepresented segments of the population. For example, callbacks can be made for when um, people are not at home. So let's now have a look at the response biases that might, that might occur. So a response bias is when respondents tend to answer in a certain direction. This bias may be caused by an intentional or inadvertent falsification or a misrepresentation of the respondents' answers. A deliberate falsification is when people um, misrepresent their answers in order to appear more intelligent or to avoid embarrassment or to conceal personal information. Or they may just want to please the interviewer, give you the answers that you're looking that they think you're looking for. It may be that interviewees prefer to be viewed as average and therefore they'll alter their responses accordingly. Unconscious misrepresentation can occur um, because uh, arise because the bias of uh, the but unconscious misrepresentation can occur from the question format, question ambiguity, or the content. Content time lapse may lead to best guessed answers as well. That it's like, oh, I'm in a rush. I'm just going to guess at what the answers, what might be the best answers. Acquiescence bias is a response bias that's caused by a respondent's ten tendency to concur with a particular position. For example, yay sayers who accept all statements they are asked about. Oh, move on. We then have extremity bias, and that's where some individuals uh, tend to use extremes when responding to questions, which that may, may cause, cause that extremity bias. Or we may have interviewer bias, where the interviewer's presence influences respondents to give or untrue or to modify answers. Respondents may wish to appear wealthy or intelligent, as, as discussed before, or they might try to give the right answer or the socially acceptable answer. Auspicious bias is when the answers to a survey may be deliberately or 
or unintentionally misrepresented because the respondents is influenced by the organisation conducting the survey. And finally, we have social desirability bias, and this may occur consciously or subconsciously from the respondent. Answers to questions that seek facts or matters of public knowledge are usually quite accurate, but the interviewer's presence may increase respondent's tendency towards an inaccurate response to a sensitive question in an attempt for the respondent to gain prestige in the interviewer's mind. So we've discussed the non-response errors and some of the response biases that can occur as part of the systematic errors that result from imperfect research design. So as researchers, it's, it's really important for us to be aware of the likelihood of these non-response errors and particularly these response biases when constructing our survey questionnaire. The other category of systematic error is administration error, and we're going to discuss that now. Administrative error is when the results of improper administration or execution of the research task um, occur. These errors are inadvertently caused by confusion, neglect, omission, or some other mistake, such as human error. And there is four types of administrative error data processing error, sample selection error, interviewer error, and interviewer cheating. Data processing error is where the accuracy of the data processed by computer depends on correct data entry and programming. So, and of course, if we're inputting data into a computer, it can be easy or, or human error may occur. So mistakes can be avoided if verification procedures are employed at each stage of the processing. There may be a sample selection error and this type of error is a systematic error that occurs in an unrepresentative sample because of an error in either the sample design or the execution of the sampling procedure. Interviewer error uh, may be because the interviewers actually just recorded the answer incorrectly or they may have selective perception that may influence them to record data supportive of their own attitudes. And finally, the bad one, interviewer cheating. So to, to avoid che possible cheating, it's wise to inform the interviewers that a small sample of respondents will be called back to confirm that the interview actually took place. A sampling error may be estimated using certain statistical tools, but ways to estimate systematic error are less precise. Many researchers have found it useful to use some standard of com a comparison in order to understand how much error can be expected. For example, a TV knocks down the number of people saying that they intend to purchase the service by a ballpark of about 10% because previous experiences indicated a 10% upward bias in the intention questions. And there are ways to handle and reduce survey errors. For example, chapter eight covers measurement and chapter nine discusses the questionnaire design that will reduce the response bias. In chapter 10, there is a discussion, discusses the reduction of sample selection and random sampling area. So there is lots of content that talks about how we can reduce these survey errors. Sampling error may be estimated using, oh, I just spoke about that, didn't I? Oops. So we've discussed some of the errors that can occur. We are now going to discuss the classification of research methods. Now surveys can be classified based on the method of communication, the degrees of structure and disguise in the questionnaire, and the time frame in which the data is gathered. So we have structure and disguise questions and temporal classification. Structured, and dis uh, structured questions limit the number of responses available, whereas unstructured questions tend to be open-ended, allowing the respondent considerable freedom in their responding. The researcher can also disguise the questions, which is particularly advisable if the subject matter is of a threatening type nature. Other questions do not need to be disguised because it's assumed that the respondent is willing to reveal the information about themselves. 
Questions can be categorized either according to their degree of structure and disguise. This helps in the selection of the appropriate communication medium for conducting the survey. But it's not always easy to categorize the surveys as the categories are not clear cut and most surveys are a hybrid of structured and unstructured questions. So although most surveys are conducted only once over a short period of time, others require multiple surveys over a long period of time. Thus, surveys can be classified on a temporal basis. A cross-sectional study is the most common type of study in which the data is collected at a single point in time. As su in such a study, various segments of the population are sampled so that the relationships among the variables may be investigated by cross-tabulation. Emphasis is placed on acquiring a large representative sample. For analysis, we divide the sample into appropriate subgroups, for example, by certain demographics. A longitudinal study, on the other hand, is when respondents are questioned at different points in time to see what changes can have occurred over that period. Longitudinal studies that involve two or more samples at different times are called cohort studies because similar people are expected to be in each sample over time. Such studies can also be called tracking studies because they're des designed to compare aggregated trends and identify changes. Having two or three different sample groups avoids response bias, which might normally result from prior interviews. But the researcher can never be sure that the changes in the variable being measured are not actually due to having different people in the sample. Customer satisfaction research for quality improvement programs is growing in popularity. Such and because customer problems and this is where customer problems and desires are identified and then survey research is used to track customer satisfaction and the incidence of problems over time. A longitudinal study that includes the gathering of the same sample over time is called a consumer panel. The panelists record their purchasing habits in a diary for a set period. Panelists the panels are generally expensive and they're usually managed by contractors that specialise in maintaining them. Such panels enable the investigator to keep track of repeat purchase behaviour habits affected by changes in the price, special promotion or other aspects in marketing strategies. And there's a nice little discussion about what makes a good consumer panel on page 163 called Tips of the Trade if you're interested in having a look at that. So now that we've had a look at the different types of errors that can be occurred when conducting research and the classification of survey methods, the remainder of the lecture will focus on or examine the different ways marketing researchers conduct the surveys. In the past, survey data was obtained usually through, uh, through interviews or questionnaires. However, digital tech is having a profound impact on marketing research and its greatest impact is creation of new forms of communication media. So we have the human interactive media and that's when one human being directs a message to and interacts with another individual or a small group, such as in one-on-one -on -one interviews. Electronic interactive media allows marketers to reach a large audience, to personalize individual messages and to interact using digital tech. In the context of internet surveys, respondents are actually involved in a two-way communication. Whereas the traditional print self-administered questionnaire is non-interactive. This type of surveys isn't as flexible as using interactive communication media, but it does still have merits. The purpose of this um, chapter is to explain when different types of surveys should be used. Survey data, um, survey data are obtained when individuals respond to questions asked by interviewers or when uh, the individual responds to questions that they've read in their questionnaires. So these are the two basic survey methods for gathering data and communicating via email and questionnaires. Personal interviews, telephone interviews and mail questionnaires are very common and each survey technique has its merits and shortcomings. Personal interviews are a direct communication between business and consumers in which interviewees ask the respondents questions in face-to-face -face situations. These are versatile and flexible method of, and it's a two-way conversation between the interviewer and the respondent. 
So some of the advantages of these personal interviews is that it gives us opportunity for feedback um, because it has that two-way communication and it affords more understanding for both the interviewer and the respondent. We're also able to probe for complex answers. So clarification or expansion of answers to standard questions is possible, which also gives our interviewer a little bit more flexibility. If the research objective um, requires an extremely lengthy questionnaire, then a personal interview may be the only alternative. Some personal interviews can last um, up to an hour and a half or longer. In contrast, a phone interview shouldn't last anywhere longer than 10 to 15 minutes or probably even less. And you know, a, an email survey shouldn't, shouldn't take more than about five minutes to complete either. Completeness of questionnaire. So we need to keep in mind that um, how we go about having the questionnaire completed. The presence of having that personal interviewer increases the likelihood that all questions will be answered on the questionnaire. And item non-response failure of a respondent to answer a question um, on that questionnaire is reduced. Also too, is that we have props and visual aids that can be used by the interviewer. So they're able to show the respondent certain visual aids, such as you know, um, a new product sample. The presence of having an interviewer also increases the percentage of people willing to complete the interview. The locality and the ability of the interviewer also influence the participation rate. For example, more people are more likely to participate at home than in a shopping mall. However, of course, there are some disadvantages to personal interviews. Some may be things such as interviewer influence, um, because some evidence suggests that demographic characteristics of the interviewer, such as gender or age, influence respondents' answers. Additionally, the interviewer technique may be a source of bias through the way the question is phrased or the tone of voice, for example. And there is also that possibility of the interviewer cheating cutting corners to save time or faking parts of their reports. Another disadvantage of personal interviews is the lack of an anonymity of the respondent. Because the respondent is a personal interview and not anonymous, they may be reluctant to provide personal information. Um, and sometimes researchers have to spend quite a bit of time and effort in rephrasing sensitive questions to avoid that social desirability bias. Finally, there is a larger cost to conduct personal interviews, of course, because you've got the human element and you need to pay that wage, more so than other types of survey data or survey collection. Door-to-door -door interviews, um, in the form of personal interviews provide a more representative sample of the population than do mail surveys. Door-to-door -door interviews can also help solve the problem of non-response which may occur with telephone interviews. However, it may cause an underrepresentation in some groups. Consider for example how hard it would be to obtain door-to-door -door interviews in a high-rise apartment block in the middle of Sydney. However, that may be the only choice if residents don't answer their phones. Callbacks um, is an attempt to recontact with individuals selected for the sample who didn't respond to the first interview. And that can greatly help reduce non-response error. Callbacks, however, though, they are expensive and time consuming, but they do el eliminate the response to that bias results. Then we might consider doing intercepts in shopping malls or shopping centers. These are pretty low cost and a large number of interviews can be gathered really quickly. Unfortunately, the <laughs> refusal rate can be quite high. Nope, nope, got to move on, busy, I'm going shopping. And the samples here may not be representative of the total population. Mall intercept interviews can be really useful if the target group is small or it's a specific group, such as children of a bike riding age. Um, and it also has the advantage of the interviewer being able to use visual aids or conduct taste tests. Willingness to participate in a personal interview varies very much dramatically around the world. 
The norms about appropriate business contact also influence business people's willingness to provide information to interviewers. So it's really important for us as researchers to take into consideration um, the different um, cultures and values of people from other parts of the world. Evidence does suggest though that um, telephone interviews are quite a good um, method for survey research because once you can get a person on the phone um, you, people are more likely to discuss personal topics than what they do in a face-to-face -face interview and they're able to provide a sample representative of that general population and it's pretty good usually pretty good quality data some of the advantages of this is that hundreds of interviews can be collected literally overnight the time travel and costs associated with personal interviews are eliminated, making telephone interviews extremely inexpensive by comparison. People are more likely to answer questions over a phone than to a stranger coming to their house. And the representative samples, um, uh, the, the interview, uh, gosh, I don't even know what I'm saying now. Um, people may be willing to cooperate with a telephone survey rather than face, rather than face to face. However, there is also disadvantages. And one of those being is that absence of that face-to-face -face contact. So even though embarrassing or confidential questions may be answered more willingly, um, that lack of face-to-face -face contact can, can constitute a, limit, a limitation and non-verbal cues, cues are not detected. There is a limited duration on a phone call because people need to get away. Um, so unless the interviewee is highly interested in the subject matter, there is definitely a time limit involved. There is also a lack of that visual medium, so we can't use any visual aids. And um, also too, probably one of the big ones being that people just don't answer calls from unfamiliar numbers because they're worried about being scammed and sharing personal information over the phone now with people who they're not too sure about. Self-administered questionnaires are quite, um, are probably the more preferred way to go. And these surveys rely on the efficiency of the written word rather than that of the interviewer. Self-administered questionnaires use other forms of distribution, such as mail or, um, or email. Um, many manufacturers use their warranty cards or owner registrations to collect demographic information and data about where and why products were purchased. Oops. Mail questionnaires are self-administered questionnaires and they're set to res send to respondents through the mail or email. These types of self-administered questionnaires are now more commonly sent to respondents via an email rather than actually put in the post. However, we'd still refer to this as a paper and pencil method and it presents several advantages and disadvantages. Firstly being, you know, geographic flexibility. So we're able now to reach a geographically dispersed sample simultaneously because interviewers aren't required. And this is really ideal in the case of isolated interviewees or people living out in regionally, regionally remote areas. These types of questionnaires are relatively low cost compared to other survey methods. However, a fee is charged for more complicated surveys or for surveys that have a high number of respondents. Now, because the respondents can complete the interview in their own time, there is more respondents convenience and there's more chance of accurate information and clearly thought out answers being given to the survey. And of course, there is the an anonymity of the respondent. As such, people are more likely to, to provide confidential or embarrassing information, possibly, when they can re remain anonymous. And, and we can stress that type of anonym, anonymity through our, um, uh, in our introduction to our survey. However, because we don't have an interviewer, the respondent doesn't have the opportunity to ask the interviewer for explanations concerning the questions. So therefore, selective perception may occur. There is no feedback and no probing for information. So, th so the questions need to be structured in a way for respondents to be able to answer them thoroughly and correctly. 
And therefore, because we can't get any feedback or any probing, we need to assume that all answers are complete. Another great benefit is the standardized questions. Um, because mail surveys give us simpler questions, which means to fewer mistakes for responses. And once the questionnaire's gone out, it's, we can still, online questionnaires, we can still make changes to it once we see that there is some errors. However, we need to be cautious that we're not creating a data error through that. Now, of course, time is money. And if time is a factor, then email surveys may be the best communication method. Um, because we're able to get send the survey out and to receive that da data survey back really quite quickly we can conduct a survey in the matter of a couple of days and like what we're doing for your assessment piece is that we'll be collecting our data over over what i think about a two-week window so we can get the data really quite quickly One of our, our response rates too is that um, I, one of the limitations that we have with our email questionnaires is it relates to response rates. Because if our questionnaire is boring, is unclear, is too complex, then people won't complete it. Also, if it just takes too long. Now, there is no guarantee that the intended subject is actually going to fill out the form and there's no guarantee that the respondents are similar to non-respondents. It's generally agreed that a mail survey cannot be considered reliable unless it's had more than a 50% response rate or unless, it's, uh, unless it can de be demonstrated with some verification that the respondents are similar to the non-respondents. So people who to help us increase response oh gosh i'm going terribly today aren't i i'm sorry guys so people who don't feel strongly about the topic or aren't interested in our subject matter are more likely not to respond to our email surveys and this results in a non-response error but there are a couple of things that we can do to increase those response rates the first thing is to create an attractively designed and formatted questionnaire we need to ensure that the questions are easily understood, that there is a cover letter um, prior to the survey, and that cover letter should include things such as a statement of why the survey is important, that it should appeal to the individual respondent, such as help us out or an egotistical appeal, that you've got the assurance of confidentiality, that there may be a descriptor a description of an incentive or a reward for participation. We should also include in that cover letter an assurance that the questionnaire won't take them too long to complete. So give them an idea of how long you expect it to take and also to how the person was scientifically selected. Money definitely helps. And if we can give an incentive to, to people to complete our survey, um, it, it can act as a means to attract attention. However, of course, that is not something we can do for our surveys for our assessment here. So we need to think of ways that we can ensure that we do get um, the questionnaires completed. And some of that can be to ensure that we have some really interestingly produced questions um, or even questions that aren't related to the survey just to generate interest. Now, there is no best form of design and each survey research design method has its own advantages and disadvantages as, we've, as we have discussed. Table 5.3, this is only one section of Table 5.3 in the textbook, presents a summary of the major advantages and disadvantages of the various methods. That so, and the different criteria being cost, speed and anonymity may be different for each survey. So we need to take that into consideration when structuring our, uh, when choosing the appropriate design. But to, to ensure that our questionnaires are understandable and not ambiguous or misleading, it's really important to carry out a pretest or a screening procedure before administering the survey. Pretests are trials that run with a group of respondents to iron out fundamental problems in the instructions or design. Screening procedures involve administering the test to a panel of experts to identify any errors. 
The tests can be given to managers to ensure that it provides them with the information they require. And you'll be doing pre-testing for your, for your survey too by, by receiving feedback from another group. And of course, ethical issues. We've spoken about ethical issues in the previous two weeks. And this is really important um, to include in the survey. So respondents need to be informed about the nature of the survey. The surveys shouldn't be used as a means of tally marketing or promoting a company's products or services. You need to inform the respondent that their information will be kept confidential and you need to keep it confidential and they should not be identified in any reports from the survey without their permission. Respondents shouldn't be interrupted or inconvenienced by the survey research and care needs to be taken to get respondent approval to receive surveys and compensation for a respondent's cost and time need to be carefully considered. So crew, there we have it, the end of our survey. So our key takeaways now is that survey research is typically associated with descriptive research. It attempts to identify, explain, or predict a particular marketing activity derived from a representative sample of people. Classification of survey research method based on a method of communication structuredness of questions and a time frame. Also to be aware of those two types of errors, the random sampling error, chance fluctuation, or a systematic error, respondent and administration. Make sure that you pre-test your survey and we know how important that is because that will ensure that there's no mistakes which will lead to down the track incorrect data collection. And finally the ethics with our survey as well. Ensure that we um, uh, include information about ethics to preserve and ensure that the research and the researchers integrity. All right everybody well thank you all so much. Oh there we go. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it. And now let me know if you've got any questions at all or any feedback. And I look forward to seeing you in class. Bye.